What's up, everyone? Welcome in to a history of basketball in 15 sneakers podcast uh, from the Grind City Media Empire. What do we call it? Uh, <laughs> we're coming to you live from the uh, Built for Tough studio here in Memphis. I'm Lang Whitaker. He's Russ Bankston. Russ wrote this book, A History of Basketball in 15 Sneakers, out October 10th. And we are working our way through the book to talk about all these sneakers and all this basketball. And we're going to, this is chapter two, we're calling it the second podcast, but it's actually chapter one of the book, and it's about the Converse Chuck Taylor All-Star. The w- probably most obvious yeah. starting point ever. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like putting the book together. Like, at first I wanted to do 10 instead yeah. of 15, and I realized, like, okay, I'm going to miss, like, so much stuff. So it ended up being 15, and, like, the one, I mean, there's a couple that were no no-brainers, brainer. but Air the, Jordan one. the Chuck Taylor was where it had Chuck to start. Taylor, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because this shoe came yeah. out in nineteen twenties, like twenty two. I think is what you have in it. I, I think. Well, I think it was in seventeen the, when I think it yeah. was nineteen seventeen that like they when did he, the actual basketball shoe. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, like Marquis Converse in what was it, Malden, Massachusetts? Yeah. You know, like near the Boston Celtics. Yeah. Um, near where near Springfield, where James Naismith invented basketball. So, you know, it kind of made sense. It all just started in that one little what, area. Do you know what they were before 1917 when people played basketball? Like, are, like, what? I don't even know, like, what people wore in terms of, like, shoes back then. Yeah, I mean, you know. That's, and when, that's, they, that's when cobblers had jobs. There, there's some stuff I didn't really know. And, like, the whole reason the Converse All-Star was cut, yeah, you know, the way it is was less because of ankle support and more because guys were wearing ankle boots. Like that was the style back then. Just so, like with suits and stuff, you mean? Like like men wore ankle boots just, like all the yeah, time. Yeah, like I mean that was just like a like, style like thing. Like a boardwalk empire type thing. <laughs> or yeah, gangs in New York. You yeah. know, wh- wh- whatever. The untouchables. Whatever. Was yeah. <laughs> I think that's a little later. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, and like that became just kind of the basketball shoe. You do have it here. It says back in 1917, games were physical. Low sh- low scoring slogs with center jumps after every field goal. I mean, look, it took them a while to cut the bottoms out of the peach baskets. You I know, guess. it's like uh, basketball was. It seems you know, like that would have been like the number one thing you would have thought of when you invented basketball is, hey, let's cut the bottoms out of the, like, <laughs> so we don't have to get this damn Can ladder every <laughs> yeah, Like, what, what a terrible <laughs> idea. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, the one thing they got right was the height of the basket. Like, that's the amazing thing to me is yeah. like that they did it, set it at 10 feet because that's where the running track was. And like, I know, like, d- did you ever play like at the. Was it the 23rd Street YMCA no. in New York? No. One of those YMCAs had a running track above the basketball court. Like, it, it must have been what it was like to yeah. play in the 1800s. And I, probably the way we played in the YMCA was like the 1800s. <laughs> but no one had to get a ladder. I guess they were lucky that whoever built the YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts, built the balcony at 10 feet. I mean, I guess you wouldn't yeah. build the running track 20 feet above. Like, yeah. that would be a little crazy. Um you know, but yeah, I mean, Naismith used what he had on hand. You know, it's yeah. like, the, the, that's the other weird thing is like that they used a basketball with laces for a while. Yeah. I mean, I just can't imagine trying to like dribble, dribble, <laughs> even shooting it would be kind of weird. But and, I don't think people dribbled like they, like when we, no. when you watch those videos of like, you know, Bob Cousy and like pre that, like, I mean, Bob Cousy was considered like, you know, a revolutionary dribbler back then. A wizard. Yeah. But like, I, I don't, I think. It was more like football, probably, than it was anything else. The back super then. early days. I mean, yeah, certainly yeah. before when you're doing a, you know, we're talking like jump 19, ball between 20s, every 30s. basket. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, the shoe is kind of known as the the Chuck Taylor All Star, and I I just kind of I'd always assumed Chuck Taylor must have been like a basketball player or some guy, or maybe he designed it or something. But like reading your book, I found out he's like a sales guy. He's just a salesman. He was a sales guy, but like. You know, his his biographer from Indianapolis, like, talked about how, and I think I, you know, I used one of those quotes in there, but how, like, he was the first guy to realize you could sell yourself. Yeah. And that's kind of what he did. I mean, he talked about playing for these legendary early teams, which no one could find any records of him having played for those teams. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, he but he did end up putting on, like, basketball demonstrations for 50 years or 40 years, you know, from the 20s all the way into the 60s. And, you know, would basically be like the Johnny Appleseed of basketball. You know, he'd come to town, 
show off basically, and it would sell Converse. So, I mean, given how many pairs they've sold since the inception, I mean, however many millions of pairs, the fact that they're still available, um, he's kind of more than earned his keep. Yeah, it's crazy that it's still available and it's still a shoe and it's still like, it's never really gone away. I mean, that that's like, you know, th that was one thing where it's like, okay, part of the idea was to trace the history of basketball through shoes. Yeah. And like, it's incredible how much basketball evolved yeah. with people just wearing Chuck Taylors. Yeah. You know, and well, but also because the Chuck Taylor was worn for like 30 years or something, like from the, what, the 20, like to the oh, 60s. I mean, I mean, in competitive games, like, yeah, yeah like no, the game from, from the invention changed. of basketball, you know, through, and I think like, you know, our, our buddy Tree Rollins with the yeah. Hawks, like he wore it late. He wore it yeah. into the 70s the, yeah. with like, a, and his had the Converse did that. I don't know where it is up here. Um, but it, whatever, the, the modern Converse logo, which is like the yeah. star Chevron yeah. um, that you'd see on the weapon or something like that. Like his had that on it. So but it, it also kinda, had the ankle circle or no? I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. But it, but it, it, it was designed to look a little bit more like modern Converse. Yeah. But as I did reported out the book and at the end, like Mickey Johnson and Michael Ray Richardson, Sugar Ray, yeah. both wore leather... Yeah. Chuck Taylor's with the Nets in 1986. <laughs> yeah. And like they played against Jordan. So it's like you had like the Air Jordan one and the Chuck Taylor all-star on the court at the same time. And like talking to Michael Ray and uh, Mickey, like both of those guys swore by it. Yeah. You know, they tried other stuff, but like they both talked about how you could stop on a dime. <laughs> and I'm like, man, like I feel like I'm talking to like, yeah, my granddad or someone who played basketball in the fifties. I mean, you kind of are. I mean, Chuck. The looking at there's you have a picture of Chuck Taylor in the book, and looking at the picture of Chuck Taylor, like, I'm ninety nine percent sure you and I could beat him in basketball <laughs> like now, and we're out of practice. But like, yeah. like basketball was so different then. But then, like the crazy thing to me is that as the game evolves and we get to the fifties and sixties, and like the Celtics come around, Will Chamberlain, all these guys they all still wear the same shoe. Like those guys in all those old pictures of the NBA, we have some of them here, all those old NBA pictures, everybody's wearing those old Converse All-Stars. That's, no. that's Wilt wearing them. And you can see some guys have on the lows too. And, and the amazing thing is like, you know, Wilt and Bill Russell, Mike and, Mike, and, Mike and probably less so, but like, you know, Wilt and Russell were absurd athletes. Like it wasn't even yeah. just basketball. Like, you know, Wilt ran track and did high jump. Like Bill yeah. Russell did that stuff too. And both of those guys played extremely long careers. Yeah. You know, didn't suffer super significant injuries to yeah. miss time. I mean, Bill Russell won 11 rings in 13 years. Um, Chamberlain played his entire career in Chuck Taylors. Yeah. You know, into the early 70s. Like, and didn't get hurt. You know, I think like, and there's a podiatrist quoted in there who's like, yeah. oh, my God, like, how could you do this? Like, it'll be terrible for you. And I think, like, I don't know. To me, that's a sign of, like, if you wear modern basketball shoes yeah. and then try and play a game in Chucks, yeah, you'll probably yeah. do something very bad. But if you're just used to Chuck Taylors, I don't know. I, I mean, I think you can get away with yeah. it. Like, you understand that, like, these aren't as cushioned as a modern shoe. And you know your limitations. Like, you know, okay, I better not try and save this ball from going out of bounds or something. Like, I'm going to twist my ankle. You know, those things. You mentioned in the book that Chuck Taylor invented weighted shoes for people to try and, like, practice in. Like like, like a bat on the on-deck circle. But, yeah. But everybody yeah. just got hurt wearing them. Yeah, guys just pulled hamstrings. And, like, I mean, it doesn't make much It makes sense, kind of, that yeah. you would switch to a lighter shoe and, like, it would feel yeah, better. Yeah. but. Obviously, wearing a heavier one on purpose is probably a really bad you idea. You talking about him as a salesman reminded me of in the you know when I was in middle school, I went to basketball camp at the University of Alabama, Wimp Sanderson basketball camp. Incredible, he was the coach. And one night they're like, "Hey, we have a uh, somebody who's going to come give a presentation," and it was this traveling salesman guy who had those damn jump shoes, you know, the ones like you remember those like that had like the the, the, the thing huge the thing front, under the, the front, front. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and they made some poor kid go up there and like show how high he could jump and then he put those shoes on and did some exercises and then all of a sudden he could jump six inches higher and everybody's like oh they're magic shoes but i feel like chuck taylor was probably the same thing back then like spreading the gospel of basketball maybe as much 
spreading the gospel of the shoes, but as much at the time spreading the gospel of basketball. Well, that's the thing. And like, that's where like, for me, like Chuck becomes interchangeable with those things yeah. because especially back then, if you were buying basketball shoes, it was because you played basketball in them. Yeah. So if you get more people to play basketball, you're going to sell more Converse. Yeah. You know, and Converse did this basketball yearbook where they would show like championship teams. And obviously it was teams who wore Converse. Yeah. Um, anyone who did a shoe during that era up until the next chapter, which we'll get to, yeah. um, you know, if they did a basketball shoe, they did a canvas shoe yeah. with like the little patch on the ankle, whether yeah. on the inside and outside. PF flyers. PF flyers. Yeah. yeah early like Keds, Keds and Pro Keds. Yeah. Um, I think it was like Tommy Heinsohn told me he wore like Wilson Beta. I don't know if it was Wilson Beta. It might have just been Wilson or yeah. just Beta, like for one year because huh. they paid him. Yeah. And then he realized like, wait a minute, Converse are better. Yeah. And ended up going back to Converse. Like, um, so at that point you weren't going to get much advantage in something else because everyone was just trying to like, well, Converse sells all these shoes. We need to make something that looks like Converse yeah. and just cheaper. Um, but yeah, I mean, by the late sixties, when, you know, Adidas started to get into basketball, that's when things yeah. really started to change. Um, you also mentioned in there that the, the way we look at Converse All-Stars now, and you know, you can still buy them at the mall or wherever the, the shoes that those guys wore were actually made differently than the ones we see now. Like, like were they better stitched more more substantial i think i i just didn't know the how they were different yeah i think like i mean you could see it now with what because converse got bought out by nike in 2003 yeah. like they were basically going under they were spending too much money and had their own factories and that's when manufacturing moved overseas i think yeah. i forget whether it was vietnam first or china and um you know chuck taylor's kind of became this flimsy yeah um more just like ornamental thing yeah um you know still wearable obviously but you wouldn't want to play basketball in them and i think now but you'd if wear you look them for at, like a if you're in like a grunge band or something right, yeah they were like right. a fashion thing but yeah. if you look at the chuck 70 which is their kind of upscale one now yeah. i think that's more similar to what converse was doing yeah obviously in the 70s and even a little bit before with like a a heavier weight canvas a little more substantial sole S stitching is um, probably better. you know and that's the thing too like Converse helped me out like the archivist and yeah. sending me ads and sending me different stuff where it's like it was the same shoe for like 60 years. And this is like, yeah, the, the, up here. the illustrator who worked on this book did a great job putting some of this stuff together. Um, but there were changes yeah. over the years. You know, I mean, when Chuck obviously got involved, they put his name on it. Yeah. You know, it became the first sort of, I guess, literal yeah, you know signature shoe. Um, these are actually those are the Earl Lloyd uh, hardwood classics ones. They the came out with a couple years nice. ago. Oh yeah, it's got Earl Lloyd's name on the back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean you could feel it. It's a little bit yeah more to it. But uh, yeah, I mean they you know and they would advertise like putting grooves in the insole just so the sweat would go away because yeah. you know if you wear a pair of Chucks and get sweaty like. They're just going to get soaked and heavy. Yeah. Um, I mean, some people talked about that too. Like, I think it was like Kevin Grevy who talked about it. Cause like there was a period where everyone started out in all stars basically. Yeah. And it's like your mom would eventually like throw them in the wash because they were the most <laughs> disgusting things in the world. I'll talk about my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not your mom. Oh. But yeah, they, I mean, they did feel sort of like, I don't want to say disposable, but like they felt like they were easily replaceable. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like, because even, you know, you can buy a pair of Chuck. I don't know how much they cost, 50 bucks <clears throat> now? Now, I mean, yeah. I mean, you could spend upwards of like 100 It's I not like now. you're going out and buying a, a pair of $180, you know, right. Nikes right. or whatever. So, right. like, there was something that was sort of temporary about them, I guess. Temporary, but back then at least reliable or like, yeah. you know, you knew you could get another pair. Like, yeah. you could wear Chucks from literally when you start playing basketball to the end of your career. Like some people did. Right, for like 50 or <laughs> yeah. 60 years. Will Chamberlain. And, but also almost everyone who played, like anyone who played in the 70s or 80s probably started out in Chucks. Yeah. You know, I mean, I quoted a couple of like autobiographies in there, like Magic talked about wearing Chucks early on. Yeah. 
Dr. J wore Chucks in the beginning in the ABA. Charles yeah. Barkley. I mean, I can't imagine Charles Barkley Good wearing Lord. Chuck Taylors. Bad things would happen to those shoes. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, nearly everyone started out in those. And they, they were a desirable shoe. Like, you know, I remember Spike Lee told me about it once. Like, you didn't want your mom bringing home, like, I keep saying your mom. Um, <laughs> Why was Spike Lee talking about my mom? <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't want to get like the off-brand yeah. canvas shoes. Like yeah. you at least the wanted PFLiers. the real Converse. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever, Buster yeah. Brown, like, yeah. you know, <laughs> Olympian, whatever the hell they were back then. Yeah. But people like, until like you said, until like what, the late 60s, 60, 68, 69, those were like the shoes until Adidas comes along, which takes us to the next chapter. Um, but I mean, you know, and the funny thing is like, some things were the same for a while, like finding out like the only reason Chuck Taylor lows happened was because they had like the yeah. Harlem Globetrotters wear test them and basically cut them down and yeah. to see what would work, you know, and eventually they had lows and like a ton of people ended up wearing low top Chuck Taylors. Well, like, yeah, I figured this also takes us to the next chapter because that's when like Adidas comes out with low tops. But I wonder how much like, you know, like we all think we were all like conditioned and raised to think that you have to wear high tops to play basketball. Right. How much that's because Chuck Taylor's were the first shoe and like, you know, that set the sort of the tone for everybody. Yeah. I think some of it was that, although like, again, like by, and you know, it was in that one photo, like yeah. you see guys wearing low top Chuck Taylor's on the court. Like, yeah. you know, Bill Russell, I think wore, he yeah. wore low tops for a while. Um, you know, when I talked to Clyde Frazier for the book, he talked about how like, his high school coach would not let them wear low tops. Yeah. Or his college coach. And then once he turned pro, guys on the Knicks were wearing lows. So yeah. he started wearing lows because he was getting his ankles taped. And you could get away with it. Yeah. Um, and it gives you, I guess, a little more freedom of movement. I mean, Kobe had the same kind of reasons right. 60 years later. But I, and, I, and I think, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit more in the later, in some of these later chapters. But I think also as companies figured out how to add cushioning yeah. underneath the foot yeah. it built it up higher and at that point it starts to get a little bit unstable so you want the higher cut to even if it's not going to help you or protect you yeah you'll feel better about yeah. it yeah yeah um, yeah i mean i think you started where it had to start chapter one it, er, you know the first shoe i guess chapter two for our purposes but the chapter one of your book is the converse all-star and it, it all starts there yeah i mean th there were other early brands there was you know a, a, a first basketball shoe that other companies have claimed but none of those companies really lasted mm. you know converse was the one who did it and was able to and maintain. you can still buy them like you can still go buy it and they're still here converse and they like billions served yeah um all right. Well, that's chapter two of this podcast, but chapter one of the book. And now we're going to go record the next one. So for now, <laughs> Russ and I'll sign off uh, on the history of basketball and 15 sneakers podcast from Grind City Media. And uh, tune in in a couple of days. We're going to drop chapter three, which will be about the, uh, well, you can just tune in and find out How about that cliffhanger. Thanks. If you're looking for even more sneaker culture content, check out the Sneak Fest show with me, Kelsey Ray Johnson, Sherman, Adam, and Jerry, live every Tuesday at 2 p.m. on Grind City Media YouTube and the brand new Grind City Media app.